we're going to look at grammar tree analysis for two sentences from Peter Singer. He wrote an article called, With Veganism on the Rise, Is Meat Cooked? Here's the beginning of the article so you can get a sense of what it looks like. The article in general is tribalist cheerleading. It's very one-sided. It's saying basically, veganism is already popular and you should join it because it's popular. It's already winning. You're a little bit late. You should join a popular growing movement, which I think is very silly. But it doesn't particularly matter. Let's look at the grammar. I just wanted to pick a uh, famous intellectual and look at some of their grammar. So he wrote this sentence. Restaurants, and th these are slightly cherry-picked. Like I read uh, six paragraphs or something, and then I picked out two sentences where I noticed some issues or something worth analyzing. So this is not his average random sentence. So restaurants that serve meals completely free of all animal products have opened all over New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And in Britain, the number of vegans more than tripled in the decade from 2006 to 2016. Which, by the way, is 11 years. Like, the start of 2006 to the end of 2016 is not a decade. And so it's kind of ambiguous what decade he means. Minor issue. So, let's make a grammar tree of this sentence. I've made a bunch of videos about this before, so I'm just going to show the tree. I took a few shortcuts to make it simpler by leaving some groups of words together. Like New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles is a noun phrase. It wouldn't be very hard to break it down into separate nodes, but there also wouldn't be much benefit. I thought it was actually easier to read the tree this way. Similarly, that serve meals completely free of all animal products could be broken down, but the entire phrase as a whole serves as a modifier. And so I've just presented it that way to keep things a bit simpler. Okay, so the main verb of the sentence is opened, the subject is restaurants, and then it is modified by all. Then all is modified by the prepositional phrase over plus the New York, etc. And then this and is thrown on, and in Britain, which is problematic, we'll get to that. And then there's the second verb towards the end, tripled. And it has a subject, number. We have number of vegans tripled, of vegans and more than are modifiers. The keywords here are number and tripled. So we have a second clause. And to have two clauses, we need a clause conjunction. So that's going to need to be this and here. But on first reading, there are just two separate parts of the sentence, and they are split apart, and it is broken. And the basic cause of that is the comma right here. If you remove that comma, or you add a second comma so that in Britain has commas around it, then the sentence works. But the way it's written does not work. You can maybe hear it if you read it. So if we're going along, and it's like over New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and in Britain, the number of vegans more than tripled. That's with commas on both sides of in Britain. Then you can hear it as an offset phrase, and it's fine. On the other hand, if there's no comma, so it's like blah, 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 Los Angeles, and in Britain, the number blah, 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 that also works okay. We've got clause, and, and then another clause. However, you can't just have and in Britain and then a pause for no reason. The comma the pause there separates the and in Britain from the rest of the sentence, and it makes and not work well or read as a clause conjunction for the rest of the sentence because there's this random comma like separating it from the verb it needs to go with. So try it again, ignoring the comma, and we get a significantly different structure. But this one is valid. It is now a single tree with the and at the top joining together two clauses. So I want to go back and forth a little bit to show you how much it changed. Here, we have the and sort of tacked on. It reads as and Los Angeles and in Britain. Which is weird because you have this other and here. 
So it's like, it's weird either way. But it seems like and in Britain is just an extra thing tacked onto the list. Sometimes people say and an extra time and it's redundant. They're like, I want cheese and salsa and guacamole. You know, that is a thing someone might say, and it is just a list of three things, and they didn't need to use the word and twice, but they did, and it's not a big deal. So it reads kind of like that. He's like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Britain. And also he made it not parallel with the and, which is another hint that it's not supposed to be part of the list. But it could be part of the list, except then you read the rest of the sentence, and you're like, well, how does this fit with the previous part? So, going back and forth, here we have opened as the root, and the and is just sort of tacked on, and then that didn't really work. Like, you try to read the sentence this way, and it's broken, because then how does triple connect? So, this is my better interpretation. We have a clause conjunction as the root node. And then we have the opened clause, so it is restaurants opened, modified by all, plus details. And on the other side, we have tripled. What tripled? A number tripled. That's the subject. And then it is modified by more than, by in Britain, and by in the decade. It's got three different modifiers on tripled. And now we can see how the sentence works. All right, let's move on to the second sentence. Canadian consumption of beef and pork peaked in the 1980s and has dropped sharply since. Now, people often write the 1980s with an apostrophe. I do not know what is technically correct. It doesn't especially matter, just a minor little nit. Okay, so let's make a tree for this one. Here's my first tree. We've got and as a clause conjunction because we have two verbs. We have peaked and we have has. Two finite verbs leading clauses. So we got to combine them with the and. We also have an and down here as a conjoining two nouns to make a noun phrase. Not a big deal. Okay, so peaked has a subject, consumption, and it has a prepositional phrase modifier, and then consumption has two modifiers, the word Canadian, and a prepositional phrase. And then the has has some modifiers dropped sharply and since. But the has appears to be missing a subject. We're in trouble. Something's going wrong here. Our verb needs to have a subject. So where is the subject? What's going on? We need an implied word. So it is the consumption that peaked, and it is also the consumption that has dropped. So to read this sentence, you have to add a implied word, the word consumption. And the reason you have to do this is because of the comma. The comma makes the and a clause conjunction. And it has to be, as far as I understand it, full clauses with subject and verb. However, if you take out the comma, then the and could be joining together different groups as long as they're parallel. So let's take a look at that. There's a significant change here. So the point is, if you ignore the comma, you can read the and as grouping together the verb phrases. So it's anding together the peaked with the has. And then we have two different verbs being grouped together, and they're parallel because it's a verb plus its modifiers. And then we have the subject as a, another child of that group. So the subject can go with both things. Here, we don't need an implied word. Consumption can be used twice because it is nested under the and rather than under one of the individual verbs. So the way you read this is Canadian consumption and then of beef and pork, sure, doesn't matter. And then you get to peaked, and what you read is, this is an and group. It's peaked and dropped. It's So you're basically reading the sentence like it says, consumption, peaked, and dropped. If that was the sentence without all the other words, that would make total sense. You would have a compound verb. There would be a verb phrase where there's, then there's an and joining together two verbs, and then that grouping has a single subject, consumption. So... 
another way. Let's just cross out distraction words. So getting rid of all of those extra modifier words, we can see the structure of the sentence better. And we, we do want to get rid of that comma. So consumption peaked and has dropped. And that's it. We could get rid of the has as well, but it doesn't really matter. So if it's consumption peaked and has dropped, then consumption is the subject, and the verb is the and grouped peaked and dropped. So there are two verbs conjoined with and. And so it's not a clause conjunction in that case. It is a verb phrase conjunction. So it joins the verb phrases together into a super mega verb phrase with two verbs, which has the subject consumption. So we got two different readings of the sentence depending on whether we ignore the comma or not. So I thought that was interesting and worth looking at. So the original version, we have to treat it as two separate finite clauses conjoined with and. And so we needed an implied subject. The, the has dropped was missing its subject. And we had to read it in as implied, which is not a big deal. We can figure out by looking back what the subject would be. And then in the second version, we don't need an implied word. We don't have to add an extra node to the tree. So that is a benefit. But we can't read it this way because of the comma. But if we ignored the comma, then this would be a valid reading. And I think if the comma is not there, then this is the preferred reading. But the comma is there, so we should read it this way. And so that one comma makes a significant difference. And who knows which one the author intended or if he knows the difference. But I thought that the difference between the and joining together the entire clauses, like verb and subject. So here we have the and joining together consumption peaked with consumption has versus the and only joining together the verb. So we have the and, oops, and joining peaked with has and then consumption being a child of and. I thought that was an interesting difference that was worth highlighting and showing. I figured most people would not be able to figure that out if they'd never seen it, so it's a good thing to show how it works. Okay, and then while we're looking at this, quick fact check. So the sentence said, Canadian consumption of beef and pork peaked in the 1980s and has dropped sharply since. So when I read that, I have in my mind a kind of vision of what a sharp drop on a graph looks like. And then I saw the graph in the article, which is on screen right now, and the relevant lines are beef and pork. So it's going to be this one and this one. And I will highlight the ends of them. So here and here. And so I looked at these graphs, these lines, and they did not match my vision of a sharp drop. I would call it a significant drop, a meaningful drop, but not a sharp drop. It kind of meanders. It goes up and down a bit. It's not just a slanted line going kind of downward. So I thought calling it a sharp drop was misleading. It led me to imagine a different drop than the actual drop. So that is problematic. He also says that beef and pork peaked in the 1980s. So if we look at the beef graph, where's the highest spot on this line? It is right at the very beginning, 1988. So that is accurate. Now, what about pork peaked in the 1980s? Well, if we look at the highest point for pork, is right here, which is 1999. 1999. That is not in the 1980s. Now, maybe pork peaked in 1984, and it's just not shown here. But based on his own data, the data he presents in his article to back up the claims in his article, pork appears to have peaked in 1999, not in the 1980s. So it could be true that it peaked in the 1980s. I don't know. Just based on his data, um, that claim is not convincing. So that is also problematic. Anyway, serious question. Where can I find the skilled intellectuals who learn grammar and then write correctly? Do they exist? If you know where to find them, I'd be very interested.
My opinion is it's hard to have serious debates about complex, controversial issues if you can't accurately write down what you mean to say. If you don't have good mastery of grammar and English and stuff like that, then what you write down and what you intend to say are not going to match. And that makes it very hard to do truth-seeking, productive debates or discussions about hard topics. Like, the topic is hard enough, people having to guess what you mean based on your imprecise, inaccurate, or misleading writing is going to make it worse. So I think if you're attempting ambitious stuff, then you should just get grammar correct so it's not a distraction. Also, oh, backing up a little bit, Singer has done a bunch of debates, but from what I've seen on a quick search, he tends to favor voice debates over written debates, which I think are worse for actually figuring out the truth of the matter and reaching conclusions and being organized and taking your time thinking through what you want to say and then saying it carefully and so on, which, of course, if you're going to do that, you should probably understand how commas work. I think the reason, in general, the typical reason that people do voice debates is they want to put on a show for an audience. They're trying to impress people, and it is not really about truth-seeking. This is not an original point. William Godwin had this complaint about people who wanted to challenge him to voice debates back around 1790, over 200 years ago. He thought that they wanted to influence the passions and emotions of the audience, rile up the audience with their charisma and their fiery speeches and so on, and that that's why they wanted to debate him in front of a live audience in voice rather than writing down arguments carefully and thoughtfully. And I think he was right, and we have the same problem today. And when you see people doing voice debates as their primary means of debating, you should be suspicious. Also, Singer has a bunch of books. And it seems a little weird to write a bunch of books but never bother to learn how commas work. And based on the error in the first sentence that we looked at, I don't think Singer has a good understanding of how commas work. There are other possibilities. It could be a freak error. Like, sometimes there are just these occasional random, like, brain farts or something. The probability of that, I would say, is low, but it's not out of the question. Even if he knew what he was doing really well, the occasional error could sneak through somehow. And there are other possibilities. Maybe an editor did it. But, um, you know, my first guess, the most likely scenario, I think, is that he does not have a great understanding of how to use commas. But wrote a bunch of books. And they're popular books. They're aimed at um, impressing an audience, influencing the crowd, rather than at being really careful, precise, thoughtful arguments for, to advance the debate. Okay, in conclusion, understanding grammar is important for analyzing sentences. And then if you understand sentences, you can put them together to understand paragraphs and larger chunks can go from there. Being able to make trees at multiple levels, like sentence, paragraph, groups of paragraphs, is important to doing analysis. So being good with sentence grammar trees is a great first step towards being a good critical thinker who can analyze text effectively and participate in productive debates. If you don't understand grammar, then reading and writing are a lot harder. If you don't understand tree structures and relationships, then organizing information that you read or write is a lot harder. So I think these are important skills that more people should try to learn. So I hope the video was helpful for people who are interested in learning this stuff.